I'm setting off on a journey to make my most ambitious film project yet. Camera rolling. Around the world, the climate is in crisis. My world is melting. It's a scary thing to think about. This terrifies me. And the people who are paying most are the poorest people in the world. What a gross injustice. Our survival is at stake. How are we going to build a better world? I should use my tools to make some change. So I'm traveling the length of the UK to get to the next climate change conference, COP26, where world leaders will discuss the future of life on Earth. Along the way, I'll share stories of people who are on the front lines of climate change. It's so wild. It's like <laughs> stepping into the Garden of Eden. Activists, inventors, and experts. Every time you plant a seed, you're planting a bit of hope. Those whose voices have often been ignored. We are forgotten people. This is our chance to take action. It's inspiring to hear that it can be a part of the solution. All it takes is for the right people to listen. This is Seat at the Table. For the last few years, I've been part of a global movement taking a stand against the fossil fuel industry. This is me getting arrested, protesting outside the International Petroleum Conference in London. There's no question we are hopelessly addicted to fossil fuels. Whether it's the 32 billion barrels of oil or 7.5 billion tons of coal consumed globally every year, the science is clear. We need to leave what's left of it in the ground and switch to clean energy sources. But when 60 million people around the world depend on the gas and oil industry to earn a living, and many more of us rely on the energy they produce, how do we create a just transition that works for everyone? I'm heading to Inverness and Cromarty Fir in the northeast of Scotland, an area that's home to more than a third of the UK's 120,000 oil and gas workers. There's a climate activist called Lauren McCallum who has a unique perspective on the industry and what the switch to green energy could mean for a place like this. I love the mountains. Like, I love going into the mountains, whether that's on my like, snowboard, whether that's by foot or my bike. For me, activism is using your life to give life. That is the basis of activism. So my name is Lauren McCallum, and I'm the general manager of Protect Our Winters UK, which is an outdoor-focused climate action charity. I live in Aviemore, which is a small village in the Central Highlands. It's just an incredible place to be, and I'm really privileged to call it my home. Just getting in swimming, mm. into like naked swimming, Abby Moore, full frontal floaters is what we call ourselves. <laughs> We've come to the Cromarty Firth port, a servicing depot and graveyard for oil rigs. I've never seen an oil rig up close before. The image is so iconic quite a stark visual representation of what's happening out in the North Sea. Well, we're so disconnected from where our energy comes from. Oh, totally, like 100%. It's so easy to just kind of take a picture of this and be like, right, boo, bad. Yeah. You know, like, shut it down. And yes, it does need to shut down, but we need this managed decline and we need to take people with us so that we can build a more just world where it works for everyone. The port of the Cromarty Firth has been at the centre of the UK oil industry since it began in the 1970s. It would be really foolish of us to not recognise the sense of pride that oil and gas brought to the North East. Mm -hmm. You know, like the sense of provide for the nation, to provide for our communities. So often when, you know, when I think about oil and gas, it's very easy just to like bundle up into one big negative picture, some, this sort of awful corporation that's damaging our planet. But of course, that, those companies are made up of people who are just doing their job. Definitely. I mean, like, what a picture, like, the rigs and then the, literally the community right there. So how, how do we make sure that when we move away from, from these and go into renewables, how do we make sure that working class communities aren't left behind? Mm. 
because what happens, right? Okay, we decommission them, we take them out to sea, right? Thanks very much. See you later. And then, yeah. A transition from a fossil fuel based economy to a green economy to a net zero economy, we have to make sure that workers' rights are protected within that transition and not repeat what we've seen in coal, where industries just pulled out and it left everyone to fend for themselves. High levels of social deprivation, poor health care, poor provisions, poverty, that absolutely cannot happen here. Lawrence take me to meet someone on the other side of this story called Willie. He has been in the oil and gas industry for 25 years and also happens to be Lauren's dad. Both my parents work at North Sea Oil and Gas. Um, I have benefited from North Sea Oil and Gas most of my life. It has given my parents good, decent, paying jobs and provided a very comfortable life for myself and my siblings. Growing up, oil and gas was, was seen as a very, very good thing. But how does Willie see the drive away from fossil fuels into clean energy. I just want to make sure that that commitment also involves my fellow colleagues and a future for them. And to me, they've learned the skills in oil and gas, the transferable skills is there to go into renewable energy. To see that go to waste, if we just say, well, that's it, oil and gas is finished, we don't need you anymore, that would just be such a waste. And it's important that we keep that going. So, Willie, we have these huge yellow towers behind us, which I think are the base of wind turbines. I guess that could be the future of the industry here. Yes, absolutely. So you've got two comparisons here. You've got the current and the old oil and gas, and now you've got the new coming into the wind turbine technology. So well, That's kind of exciting. That's it's the, the future, same, yeah. same resources, yeah. the same spaces, just being transformed. Meeting Lauren and Willie has been a real eye-opener. In this story, it's not just a case of clean energy on one side versus fossil fuels on the other. I'll be the first to hold my hand up and say that in the past I've been guilty of massively oversimplifying the gas and oil industry as just this one evil force that needs to be closed down, essentially. And being here today, seeing these rigs up close and meeting Willie has reminded me that it's like any other industry, it's made up of people, of workers, of communities who rely on this industry. Those people need to be part of this transition. And so I'm curious to understand what a community can look like that is not only embracing renewables, but is thriving on a renewable future. There's a project I want to see just a few hours to the north of mainland Scotland that is at the heart of local life. This is the most northern part of the UK I've ever been to. In fact, we're so far north that you can see the mainland receding into the distance behind me. And I'm really looking forward to this next bit of the journey. We're headed to the Orkney Isles, which are meant to be incredibly beautiful. But they're also home to a world-renowned and really unique renewable energy project. The Orkney Islands are leading the way for clean energy in Britain. They're self-sufficient and even feed electricity back to the mainland. One of the local young technicians pioneering green tech here is Ryan Dool. Ryan's family have lived and worked on these islands for generations. I think we are quite proud of Orkney and our home and that. We are leading the way in some of this technology, so it, that's really good. But to know at the end of it all that the thing that you're working on and developing gets to benefit generations going forward. And I think having a kid this year really opened that, my eyes to that as you really want to kind of make a better place for him. It's windy. <laughs> it's always windy and I see why the wind turbines are so yeah. successful. This is what it's usually like most days. But this is it, you can like feel the energy of yeah. nature here, like the wind, the cliffs, the ocean. You, like you can't help but be moved by it. Do you think there's a relationship between Orcadian sort of appreciation for nature and the incredible innovation that's happening here? I don't know what it is about the place, but we just seem determined to kind of keep progressing and keep moving on to the next thing. The fact we're able to kind of take that power of nature and harness it and make energy and kind of use it for adv our advantages and not have implications by doing it is pretty amazing. Providing electrical power to isolated and remote areas is a problem across the world. But just like on Orkney, the answer is in clean energy.
العشاء هنا قاصحة شي شوية بارك الله بنادم كنا ثلاثين بنادم أي حاجة قاصحة عندنا هنايا قاصحة المعيشة قاصحة الرواج قاصحة الطياب قاصحة كنتمنوا قاعد شي فاش تستفد الناس تا حنا كنتمنوا نستفدوا منه حتى حنا لا جابنا الحالات ديال الضب وانا اي حاجه حتى حنا شي بغات نوريكم كنتمنى حتى حنا بحال هكا حيت شحال من حاجه كنجيبو دابا في السوق حيت بعيد لينا الروايج شحال من حاجه كنجيبو في السوق كنضيعو فيها الا ما حفظوش فيا بالنهار اللي راه ما عندهمش حفاضه صافي بغيت نطفيو الضو صافي حنا هكا كيبقى كاس والو ملي كنطفيو البوطه صافي كل واحد في المحل ديالو بلا ضو بلا والو The Bazidi family's village is in a rural area and not connected to the main electricity grid. Hooking them up would be difficult and expensive. But the answer could lie in a new generation of green technology, which doesn't come from big business, but small-scale entrepreneurs. Today, the vision is that we need to replace all the energies that is harmful to the environment like fossil uh, energy. My name is Youssef Al-Hafidi. I'm 29 years old. I'm from Casablanca. I'm uh, an entrepreneur and I'm also a university professor. Using his expertise in physics, Youssef has founded a startup that aims to give green electric power to everyone who needs it. Across the African continent, around 600 million people have no access to electricity, and most live in rural areas. Youssef and his team have invented a range of cheap green tech that generates electric power, and he's on his way to install it at the Bazidi family's village. Out to meet him is head of the family, Lassun. They have no power, and they cannot be connected to the grid because it's costing a lot of money. The Bazidi family are traditional farmers who have been working on these lands for generations. It's a tough way of life, made harder without the basic benefits electricity brings. So we can say that our technology, it's a life-changing technology for this kind of families. Youssef's mobile power station can generate electricity by harnessing whatever natural energy source is most available locally, whether it's wind, water, or solar power. So for this family, we, because it's a really hot environment, so we choose solar panels and we choose a manual crank. Getting power from solar panels uh, is really a source uh, of freedom for people living in this uh, kind of villages. And uh, uh, it's a green technology, so it's accessible and affordable for a lot of people who don't have a lot of money. Our technology will solve the daily issues in terms of cooking, lighting, refrigeration, uh, and so on. And if you run out of the main energy supply, you can use people power instead with a hand-cranked generator. Whether it's generating electricity for one family or hundreds, clean energy works by harnessing the planet's natural elements. And on a large scale, it calls for some pretty futuristic technology. In the Orkney Islands, Ryan is in charge of one of the strangest machines I've ever seen. Wow. Look at this thing. It is quite amazing. And I feel like I'm on a spaceship right now. This is like the most it's, alien yeah. place I've ever been. It's even got a proper submarine door. Can I try it? Yeah, I've go for it. I've always wanted to do one. <laughs> <sighs> Gotta get you out of there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it is a submarine. Ryan, this may sound like a stupid question at this point, but what actually is this thing and how does it work? So this is a tidal turbine. These are our legs. And on the end of the legs is our blade. 
so the blade is what actually turns in the tide and produces the power that's then fed back up into the machine, conditioned and exported back to shore. It's almost like two wind turbines that are yeah. on articulated arms. Yeah, pretty much. It's exactly the same principle, but we're just, instead of using the wind to turn our blades, we're using the tide to turn. So as the tide rushes through here and yeah. then rushes back, it spins the propellers, creating energy? Yes. How many people does something like this provide power to? So one of these machines will provide enough power for 1,700 UK homes. OK. That's so it's pretty, pretty impressive, yeah. Wow. So then the idea is to scale them up and one day there might be a, a fleet of orbital. It's all scalable, so bigger blades, more catchment area, more power. So it's just about how big we can go, really. Why is this here in the Orkney Isles? Because it's a group of islands, you've got great tidal channels, so the tide rips by at about four metres a second. Right, so it's a particularly strong yeah, tide here. Yeah, very strong tide. So many people, understandably, are terrified of the change that's coming. I think it's what we fail to talk about when we talk about this transition is the jobs that will be created, the opportunities that are here. And are you seeing that in your industry? The last two places we've built these turbines have been shipyards that have not built a ship for 50, 60 years. In the fabrication side, it's, it's no different. So you're getting guys that's been in that industry all their life that have the skills and it's transferable. So we're going to places in the UK that's kind of needing work, it's needing industry back there so we can make these things here. We've got this technology, it can be built in the UK. Orkney being such a small place and we're having such a huge impact on all this different technologies and that, I think it shows that even a small place can make quite a big difference, so I think if we can kind of set the example and then try and get other people to follow, I think we could kind of be the start of something quite big. Ryan's hopes of harnessing the elements and growing it into something the whole community can benefit from reminds me of Youssef's approach. Hey Youssef, how's it going? Hi Jack, how are you? It's so good to be connected with you. Thanks for taking the time to get on the call. Thank you very much also. I'm curious to understand what it's like for you when you go to meet a family, for example, who don't have power and you help them get connected to energy. What's that like for you when you have that experience? It's a, a very special feeling. I mean, when you see the, 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 the smile of kids, it looks like if there's a light coming from the lamps and it goes to the heart of the families and then it goes uh, to our heart. So for me, this is the best reward uh, a green entrepreneur can, 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 could receive. We talk so much about the climate destruction and devastation, but we need to tell stories of innovation, of creativity, people like you who are sort of using your talents and your techniques to, to come up with solutions. For me, if I consider myself as a green uh, entrepreneur, we are looking for uh, sustainable developments and also in terms of economy, because if you are looking for clean and green environment, you should also take care of the economy. You can do uh, with small engagements, you can really bring uh, the change in, in, in our community. 100%, yeah, and I think it's about reframing yeah. this as an opportunity to be able to make a better world and to be able to improve people's lives whilst tackling climate change. It doesn't have to be a sacrifice. It's about rethinking the way we live in a way that works better for people and planet. And as you say, there's economics in there as well, like there's an opportunity to be, be able to build businesses. And I think those are the stories we have to tell. Um, you know, there's so much opportunity in this space, and I think you're, you're proving that. Thank you very much for all this uh, good uh, and positive energy that you are sharing. Yeah, it's been such a pleasure, Youssef, and I hope we can stay in touch, you know, as we head our way towards COP26. Thank you very much, and uh, see you. All right, see you later, Youssef. Thank you. Bye. Pioneers like Youssef and Ryan have been able to harness the power of nature and give it back to their communities. But not only that, but also to be resilient. And I think it's that same spirit that we need now to adapt to the changes that are coming down the line. When we're faced with challenges as humans, we're incredibly good at being creative and finding ways to take on those challenges. And it's a reminder of that incredible human spirit that we're gonna need going forward into the future. To me, embracing our future in clean energy means us acknowledging our past in oil and gas so we can all move on together. It's a nice thought to think we could be stood on this boat 10 years from now and instead of these metal structures, there'll just be huge turbines coming out of the water and it will be just as productive and just as exciting, but it'll just be a, a different industry that have grown up here. Totally. And especially this area can be a real success story. 
you know, I think it's all to play for. The clean energy revolution is coming, but will the leaders at COP26 help make sure it arrives quickly enough? My message to uh, COP26 global leaders, uh, please support entrepreneurs like me to bring the change to our community. There is literally nobody coming to save us. We're gonna have to save ourselves. Stop f***ing about, Gilmot. <laughs> I think would be my message. It's not very poetic, but just f***ing get on with it, will ya? In the next episode of Seat at the Table, it's like man versus nature times 100. How the best ways to capture carbon and save us from climate change aren't what you might expect. Sorry, you're cutting down trees in order to restore the land. Yeah. Remember the 70s when they thought trees were a good idea? <laughs> Timber! Yay! Woo! Once you've done a snorkel, that's when you understand why it's important to protect the cow forest. Every individual makes an impact on the planet every day, and you get to choose what sort of impact you make.